your speakers can uh, put their camera on so we can um, see your face. Um, so I am Isabel Kowalski, Global Head uh, Construction at SCORE. I'm talking today as part of my role at uh, the Association of Engineering Interests, being uh, responsible for the ESG Permanent Working Group. Um, this is the first webinar we do under this uh, working group, um, uh, talking about ESG. And there we will try to increase awareness of uh, this community on, on what ESG means for um, our line business. So I'm glad to have all you there. I don't know how many participate, maybe for more than 50 now, which is uh, very good. So today you will have three presentations. So stay tuned. You'll have Günther Schneider. Günther is Principal Risk Engineer at Zurich Resilience Solution. He will share um, uh, with you his experience on site as he's traveling all around the world and have quite quite good pictures to show about what the construction industry is, is uh, living at the moment. Uh, Michelle Lacroix, she's the Group Head of, of Sustainability at SCORE. She has very wide experience on finance and she will introduce what sustainable finance means. And then you will have uh, Daniel McCarthy. Daniel is a senior associate at uh, Meridiam, a large investment development company. He will um, introduce their ESG tool that they have uh, put in place and uh, show us in practice how ESG strategy is assisting their long-term approach. Uh, you will uh, um, so your questions in the chat already said. Uh, Stephanie will also put a questionnaire in the in the chat or in the Q and A uh, session. If you have not filled in this questionnaire yet, uh, please uh, do it, and we will. Uh, uh, it will help the group, yes, the working group, to um, to develop um, in the future. So thank you all, and I'll pass the mic to uh, Günther. Thank you, Günther. Okay, so let's try to share. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to have my first. Uh, let's say, uh, conversation on anemia webinar. And you can, or you heard already my position within Zurich Resilience, I guess I, solutions, I guess I know a lot of people here on the call today. And so let's dive into what I will talk to you about. So there will be a short introduction. Then uh, we'll have a look what's happening on site. Furthermore, we will uh, discuss a bit this uh, nice picture of this balancing person of the three aspects of uh, E, S and G. Some final remarks and that's from my side. So if we step into the into the presentation, it's uh, for those who were at the commercial risk conference in May earlier that year. It's some kind of a repetition maybe. Uh, just as a short reminder, you see the the sustainability goals uh, from the UN de developed uh, in 2015, which then was transferred into this ESG system uh, in the upcoming years. Then, and let's say we can we talk about the, of course the efficiency energy efficiency for example it's a, a circle economy is a quite important on site then of course is labor rights health and safety aspects and then the governance is mainly about uh, business ethics if you want to sh to keep that short and another slide i showed there already is this uh yearly co2 emission slide you can see here it's going up since uh, quite a while now 50 years and just as a short reminder we had the, per the paris agreement uh, with the two degree goal and the net zero emissions in 2050 when we look at the construction industry and we have, have quite a large share of this uh, co2 emissions and with the expected growth until 
2030, we expect up to then 20 gigatons of CO2 per year of emissions in the construction industry. If you want to have a net zero at 2050, that makes calculation quite easy. And that means we have to reduce every year one gigaton emissions. Just keep in mind that uh, without growth from 2030, so it's even more. And when you look at the, at the graphic, also keep in mind the zero line is not here. Unfortunately, the zero line is down here. And as a last uh, point on this slide, you can see here that the ditch of the COVID impact in 2020, which is about or which was about 2.6 gigatons of reduction. When we look into the environment, environmental challenges, one of the key issues also for insurance companies are the climate risks. So due to the climate change, we have a, an increase of frequency and severity of natural catastrophes and the physical protection against these events, either catastrophic events or change of the weather pattern, requires additional protection measures and for life and infrastructure, and this will increase the CO2 emissions in addition to what we have already. On the other hand, as mentioned already, then we have uh, the efficiency gains we we are looking for waste management, circular economy, and reduction of pollution, water, air, land, all these aspects. And this then will bring a, a reduction of CO2 emissions. Okay. So when we have a look a bit in this, uh, let's say, environment of regulations and standards and principles and protocols and goals. Let's try to find out what does that mean for a real construction site at the end and what, what do we see there or what type of uh, developments we can see there. And before I start, it's just a, a little uh, side note and that uh, at I don't know, 20 years ago, abbreviations had three letters. Now we have four or five, and we have uh, almost an avalanche of different uh, different abbreviations coming to, to site. And all the underwriters, at least uh, listening now, they see it on the bottom left, there is at least one uh, abbreviation, which is uh, basically well known in the insurance industry, the gross written premium. And then we have other a bit more complex abbreviations like the REDD plus, and that's only a selection of all that. So a bit closer to construction sites, one of the aspects is uh, for the middle as the social uh, aspects is the working conditions and health and safety aspects. So we we see here the the workers and can't remember, I guess it's the Lutschberg base tunnel 100 years ago or even more than 100 years ago where there were basically no, uh, no uh, safety measures at, at all. On the left side, you see then a quite a comprehensive description of all safety measures and um, on the on the right hand side at the bottom is a bit more pragmatic how it looks like on a real construction site and also a bit more reasonable. Nevertheless, uh, there are not nevertheless, but because of all that, there were a lot of improvements made in the last 50 years. So the number of accidents goes down and also the number of fatalities uh, goes down uh, substantially. Never. However, every accident is one too many and there is never enough to do about that. And here you can see two construction sites and on the left. It's quite uh, interesting, very well organized. But uh, also here we have this little bridge across this gap here. I just I don't know why they came on the idea to have it. And on the other picture, you see this, uh, uh, this uh, reinforcement steel protected with a Coke can exactly on the right height, either for me or somebody else who is a bit taller, 
just to, to hit your eye. And the last example, uh, scaffolding often leads upwards, but not always to perfection. Also in this case, I'm not sure uh, if you want to go one floor higher up on this scaffold. We have another look uh, on construction sites. Uh, let's say this is a hydropower plant a site in Switzerland, in the mountains, obviously. And at the end, and no, just a, a short point here, you can see here the cable car station on top of it or bringing up the, all the material to the construction site. And when you look, compare this picture with the final situation two or three years later of completion of the of the project, you can see here on the right hand side the new concrete dam which was built there, and everything else is uh, gone away, taken away, and it looks like before, and that improved also a lot compared to the time fifty years ago. Another aspect on site are these uh, temporary camps or workshops or warehouses, offices, all that. And now regardless of the quality of the fire protection or the fire, uh, the combustibility of the insulation material, that's another risk engineering topic, but not ours today. We have as well here, uh, on the left hand side on this picture, we have a new workers uh, site camp. It's a fantastic place. It's very nice. It's very comfortable. It's even uh, planned to to modify that in the future into residential buildings after project completion. But all these buildings have in common that the insulation is is miserable. And uh, the the waste of energy is, uh, I would say, enormous. So in winter time you have to heat like uh, like crazy, and in summer time you have to cool. And I'm not sure if that's uh, the plan of our ESG uh, efforts. But anyway, that's the situation, and doesn't look very uh, promising, to be honest. Another phase, design phase or project study, and we have here an example from the International Hydropower Association. They already have in place their own system with guidelines, with assessments, gap analysis. And let's say when you look at the circle, quite a complex uh, you know, system of topics they, they want to uh, cover in the project study or design phase. On a recent project I visited, they created an environmental and social impact assessment report. And of course, in there, all the stages are covered. So design, construction, operation, but also decommissioning. They discuss in there the resettlement uh, topic, erosion, sedimentation, downstream flow, and so on. Also, Part of this uh, of this uh, environmental plan is the communication, procurement processes, governance process processes. So it's covering a lot of these sustainability goals from the UN. And even one of my topics, or one of my favorite topics, they also discussed uh, if it's necessary to have a, a bottom outlet and a hydropower plant. And they came to the, they come hopefully to the conclusion that uh, it's necessary for emergency drawdown of the reservoir. And even it is also required if ever you have to decommission the plant because uh, let's say, uh, although uh, good projects, uh, they are not built for eternity. And as I'm saying that, uh, saying this, you know that. Uh, I will come back to this topic in a minute because I said it's one of my favorites. 
In this report, they also discuss uh, risks and opportunities. And here is one of the opportunities, and then that's a bit, let's say, contradictory to the circle on the left. Uh, so they say, okay, because the temperature is rising due to climate change, this uh, one of the opportunities is to sell uh, more electricity in summertime to to run uh, cooling and uh, air conditioning systems, which are obviously increasing the revenue of the hydropower plant, but for the overall uh, let's say targets of ESG, that's not what we are looking for. And on the left, you see a possible location of a new hydropower plant, by the way. And then, of course, there are always other opinions and it doesn't have to be Greenpeace who is active on such sites. It can be local persons and organizations. And one of the points came up was, uh, why don't you use the same amount of money to refurbish the existing hydropower plants and to increase the efficiency of them, and you get the same energy output as if you would build a new hydropower plant in this valley here. So, as uh, mentioned before, um, one of my topics, the lovely, uh, how to say, favorite topics, these bottom outlet discussions. And it's quite a famous theme on the picture, as you all know, in the insurance industry. Again, how, how can you draw down the, the water level if you don't have a bottom outlet? And whatever in the future will happen in 100 years or so, if you have to decommission the plant, you cannot do that without the bottom outlet. And of course, uh, this was designed when already the the, the sustainability uh, process was in place of the International Hydro Power Association. So, what was the consequence of this fact on this uh, project here in Colombia? And we have other examples with uh, earth dams without uh, bottom outlets. We have another. Uh, Let's say a uh, bad example here, this one in in Turkey, the Ilisu uh, hydropower plant. And one of the main topics is the sedimentation. So on one hand, it's interrupted for the downstream areas and the sedimentation was some kind of the natural fertilizer for these areas, like on like in Egypt, for example, on the Nile. On the other hand, upstream, you have the problem that the, the sediments will basically fill up the reservoir and this will reduce the, the possible production time of electricity. And in this case, they talk about 45 years. And at least it's, uh, yeah. It will raise some questions. Why, why can you build uh, a dam of this size when you know that the horizon of production is only 45 years. Another aspect, um, what I call uh, ESG, on, ESG on construction sites, although it's more the material supply. Here, a few figures uh, about the cement production. And you can see that's going up and up. You also see uh, the CO2 emissions uh, for one ton of cement, the emissions are 700 kilos. In the meantime, a lot of uh, companies, and they try to reduce this uh, CO2 emissions and you can see they can go down to about 20% of that value. And on the bottom left, you see also last year, the share of some kind of green cement, whatever, I mean, there is a certain range, as you can see, from 80 to 170 kilos per ton. But the whole, uh, the global share of all green cement was about 7% at the moment. So uh, it's a long way to go to say, OK, we want to have much higher number of green cement compared to the, let's say, original or normal cement. So. These were a few examples, and now we go back to this uh, slide that uh, Isabel showed at the EMEA conference in September. 
there is no basically there's no optimum saying uh, more e more the, the most e the most s and the most g is the best solution probably but there is a balance in between and they are basically uh, influencing each other and i have prepared one or two examples here we can see one about the climate risks and the protection measures so on one on the left hand side is a flood protection in the Netherlands, or on the right hand side, the same idea for flop protection in Venice. And you can see on both pictures that substantial concrete and steelwork uh, are necessary to build that. And it's uh, not possible to do that with uh, whatever, with timber or, or clay bricks. You really need concrete and steel. And all that will obviously uh, massively increase CO2 emissions. So overall, you have a negative impact on the environmental aspect, but obviously a positive impact on the social aspect because the people does not have to be relocated or resettled. When you go to another example, about renewable energy, you see the very nice uh, Marmorera uh, storage lake in Switzerland on the right hand side. How it looks like in these days. And, uh, but you also can see on the left hand side the nice village of Marmorera before they built the dam. And here you have exactly the same, uh, not the same, the opposite of what we had with the uh, protection measures. You have a positive impact on the environmental aspect but the negative impact on the social side. So you had to relocate basically the village here. It's not a huge one, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a relocation. And another example showing the balance between the, the, the free aspect is new building versus renovation. On the picture, you see the the very nice uh, Zurich head office here in Zurich at the Mietenke. And it shows exactly the combination of the old buildings and the new building. And all together, it's a perfect, uh, let's say, perfect um, match to reduce energy consumption. You have solar pa panels on the roof. You have, let's say, everything you can do these days. But in the background, you see all the other buildings and Switzerland has about 2.3 million of buildings. And they are responsible for about 33% of CO2 emissions in, in Switzerland, so one third. 70% uh, is due to heating. When we assume that one degree less heating will reduce the energy consumption by 6% and let's hope or let's believe we can do two degrees the entire if you calculate all that together the 33 and 70 and six percent and then two degrees you end up with a emission reduction of 2.5 to three percent and although maybe it's not possible to go too much into details but it's in the same magnitude as the global aviation I mean, not for Swiss, I and mean, not the Swiss uh, impact, but it also the global aviation is about two and a half to three percent. And this, uh, let's say, this reduction of the heating temperature would basically only need uh, some organizational input. So that it's it's not something we have to you know, invest a lot of money. It's just a reduction of consumption. So. As time is approaching or moving forward, some final remarks. We we see that the, in, the construction industry does already a lot with regard of health and safety, safety working conditions, new material like this low carbon concrete, timber, recycling material. They do a lot also with new construction methods. They even produced the first uh, first bridge in 3D printing and many more activities. One of the 
critical points in the future and also important for insurance companies is this physical protection against climate risks, which will uh, you know, increase then again, uh, despite all efforts, our CO2 emissions globally. And one aspect is uh, that the project, zone, uh, project owners still or normally have the biggest impact on the project specific ESG targets. And why is that why is that the case? They also pay the bill at the end because ESG is normally not for free. And what I said before, uh, innovation or not before, but this uh, innovation and technical improvements are important, but I don't think they will be sufficient. We still have to change our behaviors. I'm sure, and we still have to change our lifestyle because only with less consumption we can also reduce the emissions. And all that, of course, is then uh, covered now in a legislation uh, framework. And the plan of all that is uh, that the ESG reporting will reach the same level as the financial reporting in the future. And this will be the topic of Michelle. And from my side, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gunther, and I will take it from here. Um, I just wanted to share with you some thoughts about uh, how uh, sustainable investment has evolved over the last uh, decade. I would say we are close to a decade of intensive uh, working around sustainability. So I will start with some logistics. I think it works. So I will try to explain you how sustainable finance can influence the way everybody works, including uh, insurance, uh, the insurance sector. But it really starts with some basic concepts that we need to understand before moving on. The first concept, which is very important, is the one of the double materiality. This has emerged in 2019, so it's quite recent. Uh, and it was designed by the European Commission at the time of the revision of the non-binding guidelines addressing the non-financial reporting directive. It's basically something about transparency that is now at the heart of the battle between uh, the, uh, the European Union uh, through the FRAG and the international set standard setter, the ISSB. The, the double materiality principle clearly states that there are two ways of considering environmental, social and governance criteria or factors. One is the financial materiality. How do those factors influence, impact positively or neg negatively the business model of a company? For instance, climate change can have um, dramatic influence or dramatic uh, consequences on the business model of oil and gas companies, of insurance companies, of a lot of various sectors, but it can also be a lot of opportunities through green business, new technologies, solar, uh, wind farms, etc. So it's, it's really financial materiality being positive and negative, risks and opportunities. The other materiality is about the impact of a company's business model on external ecosystems and societies in general. And it's really how our business model can have positive or adverse impacts on environment and on people. And in the middle of the graph, you see um, an arrow going from right to left which explains that finally what we are, the impact that we are trying to provide to external ecosystems will have a look back effect. And if we think about the insurance industry, it's so obvious that if we work properly to maintain global warming below two degrees or even below 1.5 degree, then the impact on physical risks in 10 to 20 years from now is obvious. So you have this look back effect and it's not one against the other, it's all of them working together. 
So we talk about financial materiality when talking about the resilience of a business model, and we talk about impact or environmental and social materiality when talking about what happens to uh, environment and people given the fact that companies are operating. If we limit, if we go back to climate change, which was the bulk of, of Gunther's presentation, it has become a multi-stakeholders concern. And when you have those various lenses, this double materiality, if you focus on regulators and financial rating agencies, they are really considering the resilience of companies. What, what, what they try to assess is how the business model is resilient to climate change, how climate change will be handled by uh, the up, upper management, board members, executive committees members, how they do integrate all those concepts in building their strategic plans, their operating plans, and, and having their financial plannings. The other side of the coin, the real impact, is strongly considered by extra financial rating agencies, those famous ESG rating agencies, but also by NGOs. And we know a lot of actions um, handled by NGOs against companies uh, regarding climate change. But it's also civil society. And this is becoming more and more important, especially in our business of insurance companies. Civil society also encompasses uh, people, the ones that we want to employ, the ones we want to hire. And we need to be able to handle this climate change story to be able to attract and retain talents in, in the coming years. And finally, at the very top of this, uh, of this graph, you have investors and shareholders who are now already considering the double materiality principle, especially in Europe, but it also starts to be the case um, in the US and, and in APAC. Again, this materiality analysis and the double materiality is the masterpiece of the sustainability journey. From the resilience of a company to all company, climate change has to be considered, as well as biodiversity loss, but also human rights. And it's so obvious that we need to care about human rights when doing our business. Otherwise, there is a risk of um, controversies and, and reputational risks. But it's also about diversity and inclusion and being compliant with uh, laws in all the, the jurisdictions in which we operate. Some other resilience concept can be sector specific. If we talk about agriculture, droughts can become a, a real issue, and we have had some evidences this year. Uh, when talking about mining, you can say that human rights and modern slavery can have a very bad impact on, on their reputation, and it's the same for food in terms of deforestation. Other material factors are really more related to insurance. It's really about climate change, and there we will have physical climate change, transition climate change, but also litigation linked to climate change. We also have the, the demographic trends that may impact the life and health business, and we also have all what is around digitalization, cyber risk. So you see that our business models can be impacted by those ESG factors. And to better assess this, there are several existing frameworks, the most famous of them being SASB um, and, and the TCFD, so the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures recommendation that provide a framework to disclose how climate and climate change may impact business models of, of companies. When talking about impact, uh, uh, the environmental and social materiality, the one that links the business model to external ecosystems and, and, and people, uh, then GHG emissions is one of the most important uh, metric and consideration that we need to have. It's about the reduction, reduction pathways. It's also about the carbon removal technology. So it's both risks and opportunities and it has always to be seen as it's a risk but it's also an opportunity we have an adverse impact but we are in a position to also have positive impacts it's about human capital development and this is pretty much within the company and it's also about having implemented good governance 
when talking about sector specific, we will go back to food with the same uh, the same impact deforestation, which is quite important and under scrutiny, especially with the new European regulation on, on deforestation. And if you take the example of chemical industry, it will be about biodiversity and how you monitor the loss of biodiversity linked to your business and how you try to minimize, to, to limit the negative or the adverse impacts of your business. It's only examples and depending on your sector, uh, the sector of the company, you will have different factors that may be material. And for insurance, it's also about climate and biodiversity. We can have positive impact on both. It's about health, uh, thanks to the health and uh, the life and health business. And it's also, again, about digitalization and having inclusive insurance through, through those uh, new ways of, um, uh, of being connected. To measure this uh, impact materiality, two main frameworks, the Global Reporting Initiative and the Sustainable Development Goals are the ones usually used uh, to, to, this, uh, to this respect. This double materiality principle will become mandatory. Uh, we will have all to report on it uh, with the Corporate Sustainable Reporting Sustainability Reporting Directive uh, that will come into force in 2024, uh, so it will be very soon. Coming back to the responsible investment journey, it's, it's a journey and there are various steps from being a traditional investor to having impact. So, it covers the three pillars, environmental, social and governance. Gunther has already explained uh, what's in here. Uh, it's pretty much the same, um, the same components. We start with traditional investor. As a traditional investor, we care about returning to financial capital, considering financial risk factors, rates, equity, real estate market, uh, credit spreads, uh, currencies, all those as regular asset classes that you can invest in, considering financial uh, aspects of your investments. The first step to become a, a more sustainable or responsible investor is to start to care for the resilience of the performance of your portfolio. You want to build a resilient portfolio to, to deal with this financial materiality, which is the outside in, how outside ESG factors can bring within your companies positive or negative uh, incidents. Then moving a little forward, you start to care about, about your impact and the adverse impact of your business model on its external ecosystems and people. And you start to care about do not significantly harming. It's this concept of do no significant harm. And you start to care about the inside out. A little forward, you start to be a selective investor and you, you try to answer what is the purpose of my investment? Which world do we want to live in and how can I finance it? And finally, you become a full impact investor when you try to return not only on financial capital, but also on social capital, human capital and natural capital. And that's really when you try to have, when you start potentially to have a trade off. Maybe you will have less return on financial capital, but you will start to have returns on the other capitals that you will be able to measure. So yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. That is really what may happen if we still stick to traditional investor. So how to bring sustainability in investment decisions? It's about a risk assessment. And again, we are back to this outside in and financial materiality. We need to include ESNG factor alongside traditional financial risk factors to be able to take better uh, or yeah, more sound investment decisions. We have to bring awareness to top management and honestly, 
Starting with the resilience of portfolio is the best way to open the door to awareness. It's much more um, acceptable for executive committees and board members to hear about the risk on the financials of the, of the company to start with. And then you can open it to yes, but there is also this impact, so this inside out consideration. So risk assessment is also about developing robust processes to identify, assess and manage those risks. And again, that's really what is under scrutiny of regulators and financial rating agencies. But then you go back to you go to impact assessment, which is the inside out. Much more difficult and Gunter has highlighted this difficulty. We need to find the right metrics to assess impacts. We need to understand the methodologies that are used to to calculate it, this impact. And we need to steer the investment strategy in a more sustainable way with this do no significant harm concept. And then we can implement thematic investments to, to start and address SDGs. The big difficulty being to be able to measure the intentionality and the additionality in each of our investment decisions. For this, we need to design a sustainable investment strategy with robust key principles and action plan and how we will deliver on the objective, control, report and disclose. Just um, one comment on the, uh, the ESG rating. We all, we've all heard about this ESG rating, but look, our ESG score will drop if we open a new factory that adds CO2 to the atmosphere. But we can balance that out by adding more diversity to our board. How much CO2 do you plan to add? Why non-binary board members worth? Why do I put this, uh, this cartoon on? Because it shows how ESG is an aggregated uh, rating. We have to disentangle ES and G factor to understand better what we're trying to do. If E is material for a company, it's not fair to assess it through this full ESG uh, rating, global rating. We need to see how much this company performs in environmental factors and not only balance this uh, a potential weak E with uh, robust S and, and J uh, performance. Just to make sure that um, you know what's going to happen, uh, there is a very heavy agenda, heavy regulatory agenda, especially in Europe. Uh, that is uh, pretty much the consequence of the Paris Agreement. There has been a lot of development since the Paris Agreement, but one uh, absolute one absolute factor to make sure that we are able to uh, uh, to direct, to reallocate capital flows to, to sustainable finance is to make sure that we get enough transparency as investors in what we invest in. It's interesting because as, in, uh, as insurance companies, we are all investors in a way or another, and we have to care for this taxonomy regulation and this corporate sustainability reporting directive. But it's not only those ones. It's also the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. It's also, if you are a French investor, uh, Article 29 of the Law for Energy and Climate, and there are other uh, laws uh, under uh, under development, especially the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. All of this can be seen as a real burden, but it can also be seen as a way to ensure transparency. If investors are to care about ESG in terms of resilience and impact, they have to know what's behind. They have to know how companies they try to invest in are performing in their various factors. And that's really about being able to collect data uh, in a, a machine readable way. So it can, it can sound really stupid, but believe me, when you struggle to get the data, having something that is standardized, normalized, and everybody starts to report the same way and the same kind of metrics, then it enables you to better understand what companies are doing, how again, how they are performing in analyzing the impact 
of ESG criteria in their business model, and then you protect your own investment portfolio because you are able to choose the best ones, but you are also able to better understand how they care about impact. And then you also select the best ones in terms of um, the, the long-term profitability of their business, if they are aligned with uh, the Paris Agreement, the, likely, the likelihood that their business model will survive in the next 10 or 20 years uh, is much higher. So for all of this, this transparency is absolutely needed. The, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive is about to, to enter into force, and there are a lot of templates that will enable this alignment of reporting. We have to keep in mind that we have, as insurance companies, we have a trilemma. We are investors, so we need to get information from companies we invest in. We are companies, so we have to report on what we are doing. And this also includes our insurance business. And finally, for some of us, we are listed companies and we have to comply with what investors are requesting from us. So that's the reason why understand, uh, understanding all this landscape is absolutely instrumental to set the foundation internally to make sure that we deliver on our sustainability journey. And with that, I hand it over to Daniel. Thank you very much, Michelle and uh, Gunter. Um, OK, um, so uh, we've heard an awful lot there from Gunter around his experiences and, and Michelle's expertise, um, and I can't promise to uh, to replicate that, but I can spend the next few minutes talking a little bit about uh, the work that we do in Meridium and, and, and our approach. Um, and to, to give you a bit of background, I'll, I'll spend a couple of uh, minutes talking about um, who we are um, and what we do, but I'll spend most of the, the, the next few minutes talking about how we have embedded uh, ESG into our investment approach um, and our management of, of our projects in the portfolio. Uh, and then I'll finish by uh, spending a few minutes on some reflections and some some discussion points that we can take in terms of the insurance context uh, when thinking about sustainable investment. Um, so at the start, Isabel uh, introduced myself and, and, and within Meridium, uh, I uh, am responsible for developing new projects, uh, but I also look after a number of projects that we have in, in our portfolio. Um, and one of my roles within that is the, the key link between Meridium and, and the insurance market and looking at how do we um, work with insurance partners to get the right outcomes for our, for our projects. Um, so a bit of background on Meridium and, and who we are, for those of you who don't know, um, you know we, we are an organisation that focuses on developing, financing, um, operating and then maintaining for the very long term uh, sustainable infrastructure projects. Um, we are unique in that, um, unlike many investors, we do not divest and dispose of our projects uh, and we look to get involved very early on. Um, and therefore, this question around sustainability is is very important for us. Um, in terms of who we are, I said we're we're an ESG uh, long term focused investor, um, and really focusing on you know with our with our investors and partners, uh, trying to identify and develop those sustainable projects that will improve the, the quality of people's lives. And when I I think about partners, um, I very much think the insurance industry is a key a key part of that. And at the end, I'll I'll talk about some of the challenges uh, of working with the insurance industry to be able to deliver some of these sustainable infrastructure projects. Um, and on the right hand side of the screen here, you'll see a bit about the, the numbers that we've developed and, and invested in in terms of uh, amount of, of capital um, and the number of projects. Um, and as I said to date, we've we've developed over 100 projects uh, globally and we have not divested from any of those projects. And uh, of course, there are some large numbers on there, but with that, that size becomes a, a great deal of, of responsibility. In terms of the different sectors, 
um, you know, we we invest across critical public services, um, so more traditional social infrastructure um, and other projects that improve, improve the health and well-being of people. Um, we invest in a whole range of sustainable mobility projects, uh, including more traditional um, large civil infrastructure mobility projects such as roads and railways um, through to ports and airports. Some of these are more um, are more sustainable and have more of an impact um, positively or negatively on, on the environment than others. And that's something that we really look at as part of our, our investment process. Um, and, and more and more, we, we have a large number now of projects in the, the low carbon solution sector, um, both you know, generating uh, renewable energy, um, but also looking at how do we um, 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 transition other types of projects away from needing to consume as much um, as much power. Um, very, very last slide on on our footprint. We're we're global and we we invest all over the world. Um, again, in different different environments with different regulatory systems, different standards. Um, some of it um, um, not always uh, in line with what we we require internally, and we're having to to push push a number of our partners to 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 raise their their standards as much as raise raise our own. So. I've just got a couple of slides on why why this topic is is so important for us, and then I'll come on to how we've actually embedded that in our in our processes over the last last few years. Um, but I think the the important thing that we think about when considering our investment approach and our our, our structures is that we are very very long term investors, um, and we will be here uh, for the life of the project. And I'm going to talk about you know decommissioning of projects, um, projects that are 49, 50 years long in in their life. Um, and the Meridian philosophy is very much that we will be there at the very beginning, um, but also at the end as well. And therefore considering how you go about decommissioning, how you go about um, the long term management of projects is is absolutely vital um, for us. So we like to get involved very early. Um, so we can shape some of those discussions. We can shape the design. Um, how a project is going to be be operated is often decided in those very early stages. Um, so that is it, it, it is very important to us. Um, and equally, this is one area where I think you know the the investment industry, or certainly the long term investment industry, is very aligned to not only public bodies and public authorities, but uh, the insurance sector as well, um, because um, long term management and, and long term operation of projects um, done, done well um, and done in the, the, the most optimal way possible will have a positive impact on um, on their operation, on their claims, uh, on their long term, on their long term performance. So, so how have we sort of operationalized that in terms of our our approach and our different different pillars and things that we, we measure. Um, well, uh, a number of years ago, um, shortly after the, um, the the Paris Agreement and the development of the, the the UN SDGs, I think we were the first infrastructure investor to to directly align ourselves with the the UN SDGs, um, and we really looked at how did each of these uh, interface with our business, um, and some of them are. Uh, we are having a more direct impact on um, than others, and we've selected a number of those where we believe we need to to really focus on how we can um, improve and, and, and impact. Um, so you know, here we have a, a number of projects um, in in our portfolio, um, and looking at how do we leverage those existing projects to to improve cities, communities, um, develop the capacity um, is a key focus for us. Um, equally for those projects that are either entering or already in in construction. Um, and we have a number of, of scores there. You'll see 2.6, 3.1, 2.7. And I'll come on to a little bit later how those those numbers are, uh, are developed and where they come from. Um, but these are our current targets um, over the next 12 months to be able to improve a number of, of scores under each pillars. Um, for some of our specific funds, so you'll see MIAF. MIAF there is a uh, our first Africa fund. Um, you know we have a, a goal there around carbon neutrality of all the projects in that fund. Um, for other funds, and you know we have a 
a number of funds across Europe and, and North America and Africa. Um, we have looked to align ourselves with the two degree traje trajectory. Um, so we look at each of those projects and understand um, you know, what we expect to happen um, over the next next 30 years. Are those projects having a positive or a negative impact on the two, de two degree trajectory? And what can we do to, to better that, that, that impact? Um, and um, then for other goals, um, such as gender equality, decent work and economic growth, um, life below water. Um, again, we have a series of metrics that we're assessing on a, on a project by project basis. And um, you know, to Michelle's point around how do you look at these in the aggregate, I think I would agree with her. It's very difficult to do so. And I think you have to look at them on, a, on an individual um, level rather than rather than in the aggregate. Um, so I guess I talked a little bit about our our five pillars and the things that we're we're focusing on here around ESG in our in our projects. Um, but how does that materialize itself in terms of our processes? Um, and this this slide here provides a, a very high level overview um, of the the Meridian investment process and specifically where uh, questions around sustainability, climate, um, come in and, and where they're asked. Um, and the first, the first three, uh, three areas there is from initial identification of project uh, and presentation to to our management, um, through to to making a, an investment decision. And there are a number of things that we're that we're looking at. So, so of course, um, we have a number of uh, of exclusions and restrictions that in part come from our own. Um, our own desires in terms of where we want to invest, but also from our, our investors. Um, we have a number of requirements around the early identification of, of permitting requirements and early evaluation that we have to do. Um, at the very first stage of our investment process, uh, we do initial mapping uh, to the SDGs um, and an assessment of where we are likely to have a positive impact and where we could potentially have a negative impact on each of those that we think is, is relevant. Um, and that analysis is then flowed through each stage from origination right the way to to making a, a firm investment decision on a project um, and gets more detailed over time. Um, so where there is a, a an early identification of a, a potential impact negatively um, on a on an SDG or on a climate climate risk, um, there are a number of requirements that we have to do through our investment process, such as studies um, and assessments to to satisfy our management that we can we can take that forward. Uh, and then the, the the last box on there is it's a small one, but actually it's probably the one of the most important one for us is how do we um, assess and manage uh, this during the, the life of the assets and, and as I say that as a long-term investor we will spend most of our time managing assets that are in operation in the portfolio um, uh, after they've been been developed. Um, so really thinking about, about the, this last point uh, and projects that are in the portfolio and when I say projects in the portfolio, I think both of construction projects and and operational projects. Um, this is a, a snapshot of the propriety tool that Meridium has developed over the last few years to be able to track and measure performance of each of our projects uh, against each of those United Nations Stable Development Goals. Um, it's called SIMPLE, uh, it stands for uh, Stability Impact Measurement Platform, um, and it consists of a, um, a, a large um, survey um, that is undertaken each year by each of the projects in the, the portfolio. Um, the questions are broken down into um, you know, questions around environment, questions around uh, social uh, and governance and a whole range of other ones. Um, and then within there, there are a number of, uh, of subcategories. Um, and we have uh, worked with uh, some specialists to develop a number of indicators. Um, so we can assess the impact and the weighting of each of those responses and uh, whether that has a, a positive or negative impact on, on, on each of those, uh, each of those SDGs. Um, 
that then is is is, is analyzed um, and the, the output of that is what you see in the right hand bottom of the screen um, is for each of our projects in the portfolio, which is around about 120 now, um, you have a, a graph um, that looks a little bit like this, where you see each of the, the UNSDGs um, and, and, and a score. Um, and we can look at that on a aggregated portfolio basis, but also on a project by by project basis. Um, we then give that to our individual project leaders who are responsible for their projects uh, within within Meridium, um, and they are responsible through working with uh, other parts of the organisation to develop a, a, an SDG roadmap each year. Um, and that roadmap really is looking at how do we do we take these scores and, and add further impact and, and further value? Um, and that's that's assessed and discussed as a, as a, as a wider team. Um, if I go in a, a little bit more, more detail here so you can see that that the output of um, of one of our projects um, and um, what we what we do is recognizing we have a number of projects in similar uh, similar sectors. Um, we use the outputs of these to compare different types of projects against each other. Um, so we have what's called the number of clubs. Um, we have you know, an airport club. Uh, we have a, a bioenergy and circular economy club. Uh, we have a social infrastructure club um, and they meet on a, a regular basis. Uh, and one of the tasks that they do is to share information around um, their, their scoring, their outputs. Um, their own SDG roadmaps and be able to understand what are the actions that have been taken on one particular project that could be taken on, on another. Um, and that isn't always um, always immediately transferable or replicable, but often often it is. Um, so that's how it's used um, used in practice. Here's an example. This is a, a, a an example project of of one of our port projects in, in Gabon. Um, and you can see there the, the 29 scoring, the 2020 scoring, uh, and those areas where we identified potential improvements um, the, the previous year and we, where we were able to uh, in, improve, improve the scoring. Um, and on the right hand side, you see a, a snapshot of um, the SDG roadmap that is developed and it's very specific and hones in on specific SDGs and where we believe there are opportunities for for enhancements um, and through the tool which is also available to all of our uh, LPs all of our investors uh, they can see the the, the outputs and scoring for each asset how that has changed from one year to the next uh, and where we're focusing on on improving uh, improving going forward beyond the the, the simple tool um, we have developed within Meridium a number of additional tools to be able to both assess investment decisions um, and also the uh, performance of our of our assets. Um, the first stream here is around the, the impact in terms of environmental climate change carbon um, and understanding, as I, as I said earlier, what the trajectory of our projects are in terms of having a, a positive impact or a negative impact on that the planet achieving its its goals that it set a number of years back around hitting and and, and uh, against the two degree two degree target. Um, so we can see that you know we have a number of older projects in our uh, in our portfolio such as uh, roads or large civil infrastructure that is having a, a, a negative impact um, and through the tools that we've developed we're assessing how do you reduce that how do you learn from other projects in the remedial portfolio but also also globally um, but there are also a number of projects that that actually are, actually, um, are performing well below the two degree trajectory um, and we try as much as possible to have a balanced portfolio where we invest in those projects that have a uh, a negative impact, but where there is an essential and critical need, um, but to do so, make sure that is balanced out against um, projects that, um, that 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 will um, achieve the the two degree trajectory. And um, in in addition, we do an early assessment of of all of our projects around the exposure that they may face in relation to to climate change. 
Um, so as a as a long term investor, the thing that we we want to avoid is is having stranded assets in our portfolio. So this is a particular uh, importance to us, um, and that assessment is done during the investment stage um, and uh, and reviewed on a regular basis uh, throughout the the project's life. So finally, for me, before I, uh, I hand over and, and invite any uh, any questions, some some final thoughts. Um, I think you know we. We, we we take this this issue and this topic incredibly seriously. It's something that we we believe is is unique to Meridium in terms of our long term approach and our alignment with with ESG um, and how we develop you know truly sustainable infrastructure. It is a question that we're we're tackling every day. Um, one of the things that we have done and committed to as an organisation is that all of our colleagues variable remuneration is uh, is linked to achieving um, our SDG objectives. Um, so that's something that we we have tried as much as possible to align um, the team members within the organization with our investors um, obligations and our overall um, objectives to hit these targets. Um, and some examples of that we are, you know, always working to look at are there new innovative ways to be able to to align uh, interests even further and we have a number of projects where we've been able to align interests across Meridium, our partners, um, the finance community, other investors, other lenders. Um, an example of this is is within one of our projects in uh, in North America. Um, we we have a number of projects where the, the bond or the, the, the debt um, is linked to our sustainability objectives. Um, and if we hit our sustainability objectives, uh, the cost of the, the debt um, is lowered. Um, and if we, uh, we miss our sustainability objectives, the cost of that debt is increased, um, which again, not only aligns our interest, but where you have a public partner who is also a shareholder, it aligns their interest as well. Um, and they're the types of things that we're, we're looking to do. Um, the, the third point here um, is that we, we, we more and more are investing in, in transition type projects. Um, and, um, you know, when I talked about development of uh, renewal projects, really hasn't tended to, to focus on uh, traditional renewables, wind, solar, we're looking more and more at those um, areas that are more challenging, more innovative, potentially have more risks. Um, and this is a this is a challenge for us because these projects are more complex. Um, but when I look at our portfolio of, uh, of 120 projects, the ones that have been the most challenging to secure the right level of insurance um, at affordable costs that enable a project to, to be developable and to be able to close the projects, they all sit within this, this transition space. Um, and I understand the reasons why that is and that we need to work um, more closely with, with insurance partners to, 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 to help us and them better understand the risks uh, and how they're being managed. Um, but it is a challenge and, and it's an open question around how we can collaborate better to, to overcome that going forward. Um, and, and I guess my, my final comment would be more a, a question and an item for discussion around, you know, we, we see every day a number of, uh, of areas and innovations that are pushing people to be more sustainable, to invest in sustainable projects. Um, and, and and the final thought is what what more can the insurance industry do um, to support um, the, the 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 transition to support investment in um, uh, in technologies that uh, enable us to achieve our goals. Um, and I don't have all all the answers to those. I don't have many of the answers, um, but I'm sure across the the wider sector there are lots of lots of ideas out there. Uh, I'd be interested to to hear them and have discussions further. Um, so that's. That's all from me. Um, thank you very much for, for listening and I'll pass back to Isabel and, uh, and the wider team. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. And thank you, Michel. Thank you, Gunter. I think it was uh, very, very interesting, although I've uh, prepared the topic with you. I think uh, I've still uh, learned a lot on, um, on, on, um, on those things. Um, I mean, three topic I would raise, but obviously if you want to put a question on the chat, um, just just do it. 
just feedback for me is a few key things that appeared in this presentation is think long term. My this long term is not three years, not 10 years, not even 50 years duration of the um, the infrastructure we built, but but also after. So meaning the commissioning, meaning uh, impact for future generations and, and, and that's it. Um, I also noted that these topics uh, involve all contributors to the value chain. So we don't talk only on contractors. We talk about finance people. We talk about owners, developers. We talk about uh, designers as well that, that design the, the, good, uh, the good thing. And, and last point I would say is is um is reporting and uh, michelle has uh, really challenged us on on um, the reporting that will be needed so this is also a big question mark for us and for this, this working group on the uh, esg um how how can we can we report but daniel you've shown us that to report you, it, it it enables you to to show the impact to challenge by sectors challenge a few a few um yeah sectors differently and and also push improvements uh, to, to push for the, for the positive impact. Um, I have a question, one question on that for you, Daniel. Um, you you showed very well that you improved the scoring uh, from a year to another on, on existing assets. So it's not changing your portfolio because we all can change the portfolio. You push aside the bad ones and just take the big ones, the, the good ones. So on, on improving on existing portfolio. How do you do this and how do you finance it? You're on mute, sorry for that. No, it, it's a it's a very good question. Um, and you know, that there isn't an easy, straightforward answer to that. Um, you know, for um for, for a number of our projects, if we take a, a, a large road project um in North America, there's a limited amount of things that, that you can do. Um, you know, we have uh, spent money on transitioning all of the um, the operations and maintenance centres um, over to, to net zero by installing renewable generation, making sure those buildings are as efficient as possible. Uh, but when you're looking at the inclusion of scope one, scope two, scope three um, emissions, um, you are limited to a certain extent by, by what you can do. Um, we have been trying very hard on those types of projects to work with partners to encourage behavior change and behavior use in terms of how those assets are used. Um, and we have been able to improve certain scores, um, but I think there's a bigger shift required to go from you know, 2.5 to 3, from 3 to 4 in terms of our scoring. And that's going to be the next the next challenge for us. Um, in terms of how do we, we finance some of those, those initiatives, um, I think, mean, you know, Meridium uh, recently became a, a mission company or a big corporation in um, in the US, and that allows us to put, um, you know, environmental and non-financial um, objectives at the same level um, as financial returns. Um, so actually for us, it isn't a an either or in terms of uh, prioritizing financial returns or, or non-financial objectives. Both are, are treated uh, at the same level. Um, and I think on many of these projects, um, doing the right thing um, uh, from an ESG perspective can also have uh, a positive impact from a financial perspective over the longer term. And I think that's the, the key here is if you look at the impact over the short term, it is harder from a purely financial perspective to justify. But when you're looking at what your returns may be, over the next 25, 30, 50 years, how people will use that asset in the next 25, 30, 50 years. That changes the, the discussion, it changes the, the measurement a little bit. Uh, so that's how we're approaching it. We haven't got all the answers to it, um, but we're, we're, we're trying to look at that for some of our projects. Then I should have another question on my, um, my, my table, but maybe I don't have it. Um, Michelle or, or Günther, do you want to comment on maybe on the on the question that were put in the chat where responded? Um, yeah, there was a, a debate about um, if if the government local authority should uh, provide tax or rebate relief for contractors owner back into greener building material. So so 
I think we should not undermine the uh, the importance of the taxonomy regulation, which is pretty much about supporting these companies in transitioning to uh, uh, acceptable raw material. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the taxonomy, but basically it's it's a dictionary that uh, identifies those activities that 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 can be considered green. Uh, supporting investors uh, in their decisions to invest uh, in a sustainable manner. So if you are uh, aligned with the taxonomy, it's more likely that you will get funded, uh, that investors will decide to uh, to invest in your company. And those specific sectors that are high emitting are part of the taxonomy, providing that their um, the GHG emissions of their production uh, assessed uh, throughout the life cycle assessment is not above a certain level. And this level will decrease over time. Just to make sure that everybody goes steadily towards net zero. So it's not because you are a cement company that the game is over for you. The more you will be able to align with the taxonomy, the more fun fundings you will find to be able to transition even more your business model. So, I mean, there is an alignment of interest between investors and industries to reach this net zero by 2050. And that's the reason for all this burdensome EU regulation. The objective is not to control. The objective is not to be transparent for the sake of being transparent. The objective is to provide a landscape where investors can choose those companies that will make the efforts to lead us to a more sustainable world and to better tomorrow for companies, for environment, but also for social and for societies and for people. So I think we really should take this into account because it's for me one of the best driver to lead us and to lead those business that are currently considered as the most awful ones. But these are specifically those sectors that the taxonomy regulation addresses first and it's on purpose. Ginter, do you want to add something? Yeah, let's say yeah. I, mean, I guess Michelle is the it's the better her floor to say that, but it's also a question of availability. Also, it's not just uh, everywhere the same, and you can have the same possibilities in the same corner in all corners of the world. So if you start to say, okay, you get the tax uh, relief uh, if you do this, and the other one uh, get half of it because I don't know what. I'm a bit careful, let's say like this, because uh, the text uh, is also a governance uh, chapter in our ESG discussion. And if you start to modify too many systems at the same time, you also open the floor to, let's say, uh, bypass the system or optimize the system with a, you know, with a different uh, goals, not a, not a, not primarily to reduce the CO2 emissions, but maybe with other goals. But so, what I don't you know say exactly. is also that the, the taxonomy is really European um, uh, goals uh, applicable to, will be applicable to the um, to the companies in Europe, but the world is also part is you know Americas and Asia Pacific, and all of this is, is contributing to uh, to the, the progress of the work of the of the world. Huh? Yeah, but there is also is, this carbon uh, carbon tax mechanism that are supposed to to become more efficient and to avoid this leakage uh, for countries where regulation is is yeah. less stringent. So, of course, it's not perfect day one, and and we should not hope for something that is absolutely perfect day one. Otherwise, it will start uh, when it's already too late in fifty years from now. So we need to keep it uh, pragmatic to make the best efforts. And I, I fully consider this uh, uh, competition uh, difficulties that we, we are to face, but I keep hope 
that the system will be efficient enough to help us lead to this net zero world. So we have a specific question for Daniel. Is there anything particular you expect from the insurance industry as a partner in ESG, except extra capacity or cheaper terms, or anything from EMEA? Yeah, you asked the question of, uh, you know, how how can we ensure the transition where you don't get the best terms or the, the terms you want, probably. Um, you know, insurance is very traditional thing. We need we need um, history from the past to um, to be able to calculate the future, or or even to have um, have understand exactly where are the risks but maybe you can elaborate on this um this additional question yeah no i i i, I, I like these uh, uh, addition uh stefan of uh, accept extra capacity or, or cheaper terms um I, I think they will be top two of my wish list <laughs> um will be around around capacity and uh, and pricing of course um i i think the 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 other challenge really around um, the length of time that we we discuss and we ensure projects for. And I think, you know, one of the the challenges that I see is that in the, 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 the financing of these projects, we're often looking at financing mechanisms that last 25, 30 years. Um, whereas when we're having discussions around insurance, we have a, a discussion around a construction period, uh, which then moves into a uh, an annual renewal around an operational asset. Um, and I think some of these technologies where there are greater challenges in securing insurance, there are greater risks um, or greater unknowns, um, let's say, I think you know, looking at ways that we can look longer term on some of these projects as an industry with developers, investors and insurers, I think is something that we, we could explore. Um, but I think that the, the challenge I, I see is that that alignment around long term versus slightly shorter term and how we bring it together. Um, and I think that there may be ways to do that on particular projects um, or, or sectors where there are greater challenges um, to establish alliances and partnerships. Um, but I think it, it's that that, that that I would would be keen to, to explore further. Okay, very good. I think we can, uh, unless there is another question, we can uh, we can stop there. I think it was quite a good introduction into the topic with various angles. Um, there is still a lot to do um, um, at EMEA in this uh, working group to try to yeah, fully understand what we can measure and what we need to report and maybe what is the best question we need to ask to our clients to, to assist them or assist transparency that uh, that, that was uh, also mentioned. Um, so um, I guess there will be other other webinars um, for, on this topic. So yeah, watch your your best uh, EMEA website or LinkedIn and, uh, and uh, you see uh, what will be uh, next. Unless there is anyone, then I will Thank you again for the time and efforts put into uh, raising um, education to this uh, community. And um, I wish you all a good, uh, a good uh, day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.